Low tiers are an interesting part of the fighting game world. Most fighting games have them. Many are unabashed about their low tiers and sometimes design them that way on purpose. Hence Dan from Street Fighter or Pichu from Melee. Ultimate is remarkable for having as few low tiers as it has. The game gets so lauded and praised for its lack of truly awful characters that you have to wonder, are low tiers a mistake? Are they bad game design? In Smash Bros, there is a character who makes a strong argument for the existence of, and the love of, the low tier. Ganondorf pretty much embodies the word low tier in Smash. He's been low tier in about every Smash game, except Melee, and even there, it's an argument about if he's low or low mid tier. But he's also a crowd favorite in every game. He's not good, but he's hard hitting, high risk, and flashy. He's not designed to be the best, but he is designed to be fun, entertaining, and true to character. At first glance, it seems out of character that Ganondorf is the quintessential low tier. The dude is a deathless, kingdom killing machine that's tied by fate to a dark god. But when you think about it, he's literally destined to lose in his own series. As are so many of the classic Nintendo villains, most of whom also end up in the low tiers. It's destiny and design. Smash characters ideally should capture the role and feel they had in their own games. And the villain is usually a high health, hard hitting end boss with a set attack pattern that you're supposed to be able to beat. So in Smash, the villains are often high endurance super heavies with strong but slow attack patterns that you're supposed to be able to beat. They're monsters for the unprepared, but once you level up and study, they're much easier to beat. If any character were to be low tier, it should be the giant end boss villains. Not only does it make sense, it's also fun. To explain this, we best start at the very beginning with Melee. Wait, actually, we best start at ProGuides.com, the internet's premier destination for Smash lessons. Hey guys, Bonk here, and sign up at ProGuides.com to access coaching sessions, courses from the pros, and character guides if you want to get your low tier hero on. Right now, you're watching the grand finals of MLG Orlando 2005. The White Martha's husband, a player you may know from the Smash documentary as one of Melee's best early Marth players. The Ganondorf smacking the spit out of him is Eddie, one of the best players from the Midwest. And one of the reasons why in Melee's early days, the Dorf was high tier. Not one of the best in the game, even then Ganon was too slow to be a top tier, but he was seen as good. Ganondorf, while slow, was insanely powerful. More importantly, his moves were fairly quick, especially with L canceling. His hitboxes and throws were pretty good, and he could string them together for good damage. He even had tricky neutral patterns, like an L canceled forward air, followed by a quick jab to stuff the counter hit. But his recovery has long been abysmal. The Warlock didn't clip to the ledge, leaving him vulnerable for crucial frames. He'd be punished for it across all metas. However, in the early meta, Ganon was shockingly potent, even beyond Eddie. In 2005, Bushman became prominent for his flashier style, especially for the way he used Ganon's down air and grabs to create tech chase scenarios. In 2007, Ganon would be blessed with two more adherents, Linguini and Kage. As you might expect from a Ganon main who is named after a pasta, Linguini's an odd competitor. He never played or traveled enough to get ranked, but sometimes he'd get perilously, hilariously close to slaying two of the five gods with Ganondorf, often using surprisingly deep strings and texts that you wouldn't see from other dwarfs. However, Kage would be the player to carry the torch. He'd bring Ganon into the era of optimized melee and become the character's best representative. He's renowned for being a very smart, driven player. In 2013, with the foundation of the Melee It On Me rankings, he'd rank 34th in the world. Impressive as it was, he may have ranked even higher in the earlier days. At Revival of Melee 2, he got third place by not just beating, but double eliminating Mango. At the time, Mango was probably the best player on the planet, and this upset was massive. For a hot minute, Kage and Linguini even had the community sold on Ganon being a bad matchup for Falco. If Kage was the new Eddie, then the new Bushman was Bizarro Flame. Kage played Ganon more optimally, with a game plan that fit the heavyweight very well. With Ganon, normally, you, you have to control the center first, and you have to slowly try to wall out the opponent until you, you are able to corner him, and once he's cornered, he has like very little options. Bizarro Flame's game plan was to embarrass you, and if that failed, embarrass himself. 
He was flashy, entertaining, and good, ranking consistently in the top 100 and making Ganon on ice, an impressive showcase of the character's unique movement tech. Kage was decidedly better, beating Bizarro Flame 5-0 at EVO 2015 to prove it, but Bizarro Flame's antics became legendary. And when you heard that Eichelman would be taking his spot, what then did you think? Easy money! In the next few years, Kage would dip lower and lower in the rankings, and Ganon would become less and less relevant. In today's Smash, the life of a low tier is much harder. Back in Eddie's time, if you didn't have a Ganon to practice with, you didn't have Ganon matchup knowledge. Nowadays, there are videos, VODs, and netplay. The underplayed low and mid tiers still have some surprises, but they're not as potent, and their flaws are all the more revealed. Ganon's rough edgeguarding, slow movement, small wave dash, and giant hurtbox make him struggle in most relevant matchups. But you underestimate Ganon at your own risk. Kage and Bizarro Flame still beat top 100 players and push the Ganon meta. Plus, on small stages like Yoshi's Story, Ganondorf is a genuine menace. Top Captain Falcon main Nun will sometimes bust out his own Ganon on Yoshi's for that reason. Melee Ganon set the pace for the King of Evil in the rest of the series. This guy might not be the best, but man is he fun! Just winning with Ganondorf makes a statement. Not only because he's low tier, but because of that insane high risk, high reward design. In Brawl, that, uh, plucky low tier nature would really come out. And by that, we mean Brawl Ganon was bad. Like, really, really bad. Ganondorf is in the running for the worst character in all of Brawl and all of Smash. In Melee, Ganon's much better in large part due to the design of the two games. In Melee, the lowest of the low tiers have literally broken kits. They have several moves that don't work, like the shield button for Game & Watch. Since Ganon mostly has Falcon's moveset, he at least works. In Brawl, the low tiers simply don't have a lot of options, especially against top tiers. This is part of why, in Brawl, the differences in tiers are pretty huge. Each tier choice has more and better options, culminating in Meta Knight, who has multiple good options for every scenario. Ganon had one truly good option, his down air. The stomp had a great hitbox and great knockback, and its landing lag could be cancelled, making it a great combo starter. Otherwise, Ganon's options were mostly slow and mostly average to bad and he was just as bad in Disadvantage and Offstage in Brawl as in Melee. In Brawl, this is a particularly big deal because more of the game is about keeping your opponent in Disadvantage, where in Melee, more of the game is about taking the most from your opponent when they're in Disadvantage. One of those systems obviously works a lot better for Ganon. All this said, the game wasn't disastrous for the man with evil eyes. Even though he was undeniably bottom tier, he was still very cool. He still hit really hard, and he still had some cool techniques and interactions. For example, his side special couldn't be teched, so it led to some guaranteed combos as well as tech chases, and some of his hitboxes were just way too big. His up smash's hitbox was pure nonsense. His down special hitbox was pretty large and wonky too. Weirdest of all, if you executed a very mechanically precise set of inputs, Ganon could fly. Called the Flight of Ganon, it let the normally grounded villain shoot way high into the sky for some surprising punishes. It was a niche option, but a cool one. In Brawl, Ganon carried that same style and disrespect, and he picked up a surprisingly decent player base. His best competitors were Verminubus and DLA, but there were other notables like Bloody Knight in MDVA and Pawn in Japan. While these competitors would all do decently in region, none of them would ever shine nationally. The best Ganon result may have been a money match, where Verminubus beat Ultimate Razor, one of the game's best snake mains. Still, Ganondorf kept his identity as the low tier with the nastiest punishes, and that mattered. A low tier needs something a little extra to get players invested in them. Ganondorf had that back in Melee and has carried it forward since. Ganondorf wasn't much better in Smash 4 than in Brawl, however Smash 4 was much better for Ganondorf than Brawl was. In Smash 4, the tier gaps weren't quite as bad as in Brawl. They were still pretty large, but not so large that a talented player couldn't take a low tier surprisingly far, like Tweak did with Bowser Jr. Smash 4's stronger defensive options and ledge magnets also eased Ganon's disadvantage a bit. Make no mistake, his disadvantage was still very bad in comparison to other characters, but probably better than in Brawl. 
Finally, the two-stock meta coupled with Rage better suited Ganon's hard hits, quick kills, and suicide cheese. Ganon was still bad, arguably bottom 5, even after getting buffed several times, but he had his moments and his players. Some coming back from Brawl like Verminubis and Bloody Knight, others coming in fresh like Rickles. Across the board, Ganon's popularity spiked and he became a favorite for players and crowds. His design would nearly always speed up what could often be a pretty slow-paced game. It was get an early kill or get killed early. And when a Ganon did pop off, it was pretty hype. The character had a legit advantage state with cool juggles, exciting edgeguards torn from the melee days, and plenty of tech chases and big hits. Ganon went surprisingly global this game as well. Adam, one of the Middle East best players, mained Ganon, as well as Gungnir and Pawn in Japan. Gungnir may have gotten the best big tournament result of any Ganon main, getting a very impressive 17th at Umabura Japan Major. It wasn't without reason, as he may have been the world's most technically refined Ganon. Meanwhile, Pawn scored some of the biggest upsets with Ganon using old-fashioned stuff. Verminubis was a very strong regional final boss in Smash 4, and Rickles was the Ganondorf that made the biggest splash at American Majors. Ganon was well represented because he was bad, but just in the right way. No matter how bad he was, there was always a chance he could catch a handful of mistakes, get a few reads, and win. And this is true for pretty much every Smash game, including Ultimate. Ganondorf is nothing if not consistent. He is bound by fate to fight and lose to Link over and over, and he is bound by Smash designed to be the quintessential low-tier hero. In Ultimate, there would be glimmers of mid-tier hope for Ganondorf. He got some pretty nice buffs from 4 to Ultimate. Now, his aerials are faster, opening up a few combos, or some classic Nair spam. His throws are pretty good for both stage control and combos. And then, he got a whole new set of smash attacks that match him much better than the off-brand Falcon moves. The smash attacks were surprisingly good, too. They're less fast, but their ranges are massive to the point where both up and forward smash are surprisingly good anti-airs. It's arguable if the new smash attacks are better than in Smash 4, but they're already iconic. The engine's nerfs to recoveries and buffs to speed also helped out his edgeguards. All in all, Ganondorf's good advantage state is even better, but the problem is always disadvantage in neutral. As always, the passing of time showed that Ganon is just too slow and too bad in disadvantage. As other characters got better at edgeguarding, Ganondorf's rough recovery became a big problem. As other characters got better at tech chasing and ledge trapping, Ganondorf's brutal frame data became a big problem. It's not just that Ganon's ground or airspeed is slower, it's that his rules and his defensive options are laggier too. Ganon is easy to catch, easy to combo, and easy to edgeguard. In the early meta, Ganon could abuse a lack of matchup knowledge to get wins. He could rely on being underestimated or finding gaps in gameplay. But once competitors learned how to either abuse his disadvantage or camp him out, his reign comes to an end. Now, he's in contention for worst in the game again. But in Ultimate, that means less than ever. This is, without a doubt, Smash's most balanced cast. Low tiers now have their best chance against top tiers. Ganon's mains have demonstrated that. Verminubis got off to a very hot start, getting 9th at Don't Park on the Grass, Ultimate's first big tournament. Rickles beat Best Ness at PSG Classic the next year, and just recently at Frostbite 2020, Rickles was inches away from beating Charlie De King. In Ultimate more than ever, Ganon giveth and Ganon taketh. Both the enemy stocks and his own. True to his roots, there's a raw and self-destructive power built into his kit. He's totally over-centralized around power, and it means that even if he gets buffed, he'll probably still be low-tier, because he's low-tier by design. And honestly, it might be good for Ganondorf to be bad. Because no one is better than him at being bad, in literally every sense of all of those words. As a villain and a low tier, he's great. He's thrilling and terrifying, but also ridiculous and hilarious. He's consistently beloved, at least as a pocket pick or a for fun character. He's the overpowered underdog, the character who, despite being bad, always has a chance. He's the character that's almost always exciting to see in Bracket, and when all the stars, the stories, and the pieces line up just right, he wins like no one else. 